Hello, and thanks to all of you who are joining us this week uh, for our message. We have a special guest with us this week. Joining us is Deborah McBride. She is the pastor at Freedom's UCC in Illinois and is a friend of several members of our congregation. So we invited her to share a message with, with us this week. Deborah, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. We're going to start today with our scripture reading. Our first is Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God, and I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. My right hand upholds you. And our second scripture is Isaiah 55. One through... 13. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, make it, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The word of God for the people of God. When I was a kid, I shared a bedroom with my younger sister, Laura. We had twin beds, and every night my mom would come in and hear our prayers. We'd kneel down by our beds with our hands folded and our eyes shut, occasionally peeking out between our fingers to see if mom was watching us. And we'd pray, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And then I'd lay there half the night worrying about dying in the night. But I never did. What do you think about when you lay down to sleep at night? What thoughts cross your mind? Do you, does your mind refuse to rest, racing in overdrive, going over and over every day, detail of your day? Do you take your worries to bed to, with you, or do you fall sweetly to sleep, uh, waking relaxed and, and rested in the morning? 
It seems the other psalmist in Psalm 63 thinks of the time God seemed most present and most alive and most real before he falls asleep. The writer didn't worry about dying before waking because he knew that God's love is better than life. This is the trusting rest of a person who has lived through hardships in life. It, hasn't, it isn't a sweet or sentimental picture, but has a depth of recognition about what is most important to know for the fullness in human living. This is a love that will not let us go. Even if you do die before you wake, the love of God for us remains in life and death. Now we know that the tough patches in life are hard to endure. And we've been having a few tough patches in the past six or eight weeks. But, but the, it, it can feel like a large boulder is sitting on your chest and you can't breathe. Your tough muscles tense up and your shoulders feel like they're scratched up under your ears. But the psalmist invites us to re reflect on these hard places in life and how they relate to our relationship with the living, still speaking God. It is an honest and open poem about the human condition and the depths of our relationship to God. The dark places in life are those that seem like God is absent or maybe not existent. Our souls become parched. Our lives seem to be a vast desert from which there is no escape. We cry from thirst and longing. But just like the desert can unexpectedly burst into bloom, these times of hardship and hopelessness, hopelessness can be times of unexpected growth when no growth seems possible. Here in this desolate desert life, God can be sought. When all else has slipped away, God's spirit can be felt. This psalm holds together both hurt and hope because they are both represented in our life of faith. For those of us who are inclined to trust ourselves and our own resources, the psalmist's trust is a call to self-examination and repentance. The psalmist writes, my soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, for you have been my help, and in the shadows of your wings I sing for joy. What sweet trust that is. The psalmist knows how to take shelter under the great wings of God. The psalmist says that his soul thirsts for the Lord and that God's steadfast love is better than life. Now, when we turn to our reading from Isaiah, we find that the people have been in exile for many years and have lost faith and joy in the presence of God in their lives. But God calls to them once again, come, come to the water, come to the banquet, Come and buy without money. Quench your thirst, you whose heart is as dry as the desert. Eat of the bountiful feast that God has set before you. Fill up your emptiness with good food that God offers. Make the good choices with hope and freedom. Come, come home to God. Return to the land and return to God. The people living in exile for years needed to hear God speak to them with great tenderness and compassion. They needed to remember that God's great love and, and God's great mercies were their hope. Their hope for the future and for a life back home and back in the graces of God. They are reminded of the covenant God made with them, and they are asked to remember the glory days of King David when Israel was a great nation. God extends his promises, offers them not only to a king or Israel, but to all the people, because Israel will be a light to all people, drawing people to God they have never known before. God is trying to tell the people that they have strayed away from the reviving water and the bountiful feast of love, but that God is still there for them. But they have to pay attention. They have to come back around and listen and learn and come together as a people, as the people of God. 
Maybe they weren't aware of how far they had wandered from God until the Isaiah, the prophet and the poet, reminds them. Reminds them with joy and gladness and extravagant welcome. Maybe we don't realize how far we have wandered away from God. Maybe that's part of what we're trying to figure out during this time of mystery and comp contemplation that we've been experiencing. Many of the people of Israel were in Babylonian exile during the time that the prophet was writing. The people of Israel became used to living in a land that wasn't theirs. They started to become part of the society of the conquerors because they were trying to survive. And they started forgetting who they had covenanted with. Perhaps they forgot how much they hungered and thirsted for God until the prophet reminds them with his glorious, lovely words. God promises what we must yearn for, a place to come home to when we are lost so far away, fresh water of life to quench our thirst, and a community of people who bring hope and meaning into our lives when we are most in need. We may think that we are in exile right now, right where we live. Have we chosen just to survive in a society that almost ignores faith and values, just as the Jews had chosen to assimilate into the Babylonian society? Are we so used to living that way that we, do, that we don't even realize that, that we are thirsty for the things that will satisfy us to the depths of our souls? Our culture is about excess, about getting and having all that you can acquire. Have we become so lost from God that we try to fill up our empty hearts, our echoing wells of neediness and longing with things and possessions and buying things because that's what everyone else does? I think the prophet is calling us to remember the one who is the tender, loving keeper of our hearts and shepherd of our faith. We need to learn the difference between excess and enough. God calls us to a different way of thinking. God calls us back home. Now I'm not saying that we were all mad for money or the things that we have. Most of us work hard for what we have and we support our families. And many people are just getting by, making ends meet. And some are homeless and they never have enough. I'm also not saying that there is not hope and that things aren't better, because I believe they will get better. But there is a, always a room for the new knowledge of what is right for all people. There's always the need to remind ourselves that life can be better, that there is more to life than what we own or who we are in society. There is one who still calls us to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with God, and to nourish our spirits and our hearts. We need to think about the difference between what we need and what we want. We need to be satisfied with having enough, especially if we remember that so many have so little. So we come to God today knowing that God is enough, that it is enough God is enough to fill our hopes and our lives and the remembrance of the one shared who shared everything he had with us. The love of God, the grace and love of Jesus, and they draw us away from the dry deserts of our lives into the life of joyful community, the one of love and hope. The way is before us. We continue to walk with Jesus every day. So come, all who hunger and thirst, and be filled. And let us pray. O oh, Holy One, today we give thanks for those who worked to save lives in this dark time, those who serve in so many ways that life may be preserved. Help us come together today as the communities of hope and love Show us ways to open our hearts and share the light and life of God's love. 
help us to hold life precious and to honor all people in their joy and in their suffering. And let us pray together the, pray, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.